Friends, as we begin our worship this morning, let's take a few moments of silence just to quiet our hearts and our minds, to lift ourselves and all that is within us up to God. We can use the prayer that's printed in our bulletin, be known to me, God of all, or of course, come before God in whatever way works best for you. Let's pray. I'll invite you to rise in body or in spirit, and we can join together in our opening praise this morning. In the midst of the unknown and the uncertain, we seek the Lord our God. As we travel paths we cannot always see or understand, we seek the Lord our God. Even when we don't have all the answers. Always, when we don't even know where to look for answers. We seek the Lord our God. For in the Lord our God, we live and move and have our being. Let us praise God together. Friends, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yet we are justified by God's grace through the redemption that is ours in Christ Jesus. And so trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sins using the prayer that's in our bulletin. Merciful God, though we seek to show faithfulness in our worship and our living, you know that often we make mistakes. Sometimes we are tired. Regularly we lose focus. It is so easy to offer less than we are capable of in our service to you and others. As the living God, You call all people everywhere to repent. You are judge of our living, yet you are never without mercy or kindness. By raising Christ from the dead, you have provided assurance to all that you are always ready for us when we turn to you seeking restored relationship and forgiveness. So today we come before you, and in the silence of our own prayers, We seek what only you can give. Lord, in your mercy, we have been heard. We have been loved. We have been forgiven. Let's take a moment for silent reflection and confession. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and friend, we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Hope does not disappoint us. For God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Believe this good news and give thanks. In Jesus Christ, we are indeed forgiven. Alleluia and amen. Friends, I'll invite you to share the peace of Christ with one another from where you are.
Let us pray. Holy One, you are the God of our hearts, our minds, and our lives, the God in whom we live and move and have our being. Open your word to us this morning that we may hear and understand and take it out into the world. And God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are indeed our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 17, verses 16 to 31. Listen for the word of God. While Paul waited for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to find that the city was flooded with idols. He began to interact with the Jews and Gentile God worshipers in the synagogue. He also addressed whoever happened to be in the marketplace each day. Certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers engaged him in discussion too. Some said, what an amateur. What's he trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. They said this because he was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him into custody and brought him to the council on Mars Hill. What is this new teaching? Can we learn what you are talking about? You've told us some strange things, and we want to know what they mean. They said this because all Athenians, as well as the foreigners who live in Athens, used to spend their time doing nothing but talking about or listening to the newest thing. Paul stood up in the middle of the council on Mars Hill and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. As I was walking through town and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. What you worship as unknown, I now proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, is Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples made with human hands, nor is God served by human hands as though he needed something, since he is the one who gives life, breath, and everything else. From one person, God created every human nation to live on the whole earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands. God made the nations so they would seek him, perhaps even reach out to him and find him. In fact, God isn't far away from any of us. In God we live, move, and exist. As some of your own poets say, we are his offspring. Therefore, as God's offspring, we have no need to imagine what the divine being is, like a gold, silver, or stone image made by human skill and thought. God overlooks ignorance of these things in times past, but now directs everyone everywhere to change their hearts and lives. This is because God has set a day when he intends to judge the world justly by a man he has appointed. God has given proof to this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. We humans have such an odd relationship with the unknown, don't we? We certainly experience some fear and trepidation toward the unknown, right? The scariest part of any psychological thriller or horror movie is that part where the camera focuses in on the face of whoever's in the scene, right? And we can hear the scary and suspenseful music, and we can see the dawning horror on the first person's face, but you can't actually see what they're afraid of. Those few drawn-out moments of not being able to see are worse than everything else, right? That's our human innate fear of the dark. When I was a kid, before my parents, before it was possible really to have like waste management come all the way out to the country where we lived, we would separate our garbage into paper garbage that my dad could burn in the shop furnace and food garbage. And the food garbage would stay in this ice cream pail under the sink and when it got full, we would have to go and empty it out in the woods, away from the house, so that any raccoons or anything else that wanted to eat it would stay away from the house. Inevitably, when it was my turn to empty it, which it always was, by the way, it was always my turn, I would inevitably forget until like 10 o'clock at night, when it was dark, and I would have to walk that blasted bucket 
out to the woods in the pitch dark, not being able to see what was around me, what was just past the edge of the flashlight, was the worst part. And then there's that fear that comes with any medical or health situation, right? Either for ourselves or our loved ones. And those first moments, the first moments when we realize that something is wrong, the first moments between tests or examinations and results, the first moments after we've received a diagnosis but don't know what comes next, we are overwhelmed with the magnitude of the unknown. And yet, as human beings, we are also fascinated by the unknown. Famed British author and essayist Aldous Huxley said, there are things known and there are things unknown, and in between are the doors of perception. That fascination with the unknown has fueled every scientific breakthrough since human beings first started investigating and inventing things, right? We have had a stunning example of this if you caught the news this past week. They're getting the initial test images from the James Webb Space Telescope. And one of the ones that they released was an image that has revealed the never before captured uh, Sagittarius A, which is the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. What scientists call the gentle giant that's gravitational pull literally holds our everything together something we couldn't have found if we weren't probing into the unknown. And it's a fascination that extends far beyond the realm of the real into the vast reaches of the fictional. Anytime anyone imagines what could be in the unknown, a story is born. There's the fictional representations of could, what could have been in the past, right? In those blacked out sections of history that have been lost to time and memory. <clears throat> Either what has been lost in the historical records or what was never a part of the historical records to begin with. If you are a Ken Follett fan, Ken Follett's Kingsbridge series, um, his books, The Evening and the Morning, Pillars of the Earth, World Without End, and A Column of Fire is just such an imagining into the unknown. It imagines the building of a great cathedral in a small English village and the, the life that goes on around and through that cathedral through the centuries. It's a series based in historical fact, but fueled by the unknown storylines of people's lives. And of course, there is the fictional representation of the future. Hear that okay. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its continuing mission to explore strange new worlds. To seek out new life and new civilizations. To boldly go where no one has gone before. Star Trek, right? Next generation. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Not to be confused with all of the other iterations. <laughs> Truly, throughout history, the church has played a significant part in wondering about the unknown. I mean, in essence, that's faith, right? We can't empirically prove the existence of God. There are all the more mystical, complex elements of our theology and our tradition, things like the theology of the Trinity, how God can be three separate persons, but also one God. We can't even wrap our minds around all that God is because God is God and we are not. And so in that space of unknown between us and God, we find faith. 
And today's scripture reading is a fascinating example of that interaction between faith and unknowing. Paul's experience in the city of Athens. Now first we need to back up for a little bit of context. There are actually only a few verses in between what we read last week and where we start our reading today, but there's a lot of action that happens in those verses. If you remember last week, Paul and Silas were at the home of a prison guard in the city of Philippi. They had been beaten and thrown in prison for their act of witnessing. And then they were praying and singing hymns in the jail. And the earthquake happened and loosed all the chains and broke open the doors. But when they stayed put instead of fleeing, their conviction and their witness convinced the prison guard and his whole family to be baptized and to follow Christ. So from there, in Philippi, Paul and Silas journey to Thessalonica. And in Thessalonica, they experience all sorts of resistance and persecution from the Jews in that city who weren't very happy that all the Gentile God worshipers were a part of the circle. So they form a mob that's intent on arresting Paul and Silas, similar to the situation that Paul and Silas had just escaped in Philippi. They don't actually get a hold of Paul and Silas themselves, but they kind of arrest all of the people that were housing Paul and Silas. And so some of the other believers slip Paul and Silas out of Thessalonica in the dead of night. And Paul and Silas head to Berea. In Berea, they receive a much more hospitable welcome. People are happy they're there. They're talking about faith. But those from Thessalonica were still so outraged and so worked up by what Paul and Silas had been doing in their city that they followed Paul and Silas to Berea and started working things up there. So the believers in Berea sent Paul away to the coast. They kept Silas and the others in Berea, thinking maybe that if they separated them, they could get them out easier, planning to reunite them as soon as possible. So the verse just prior to what we started our reading with this morning said, those who escorted Paul led him as far as Athens, then returned with instructions for Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible. So as our passage for today begins, one of the scholars that I read this week summed up Paul's situation pretty well. He said, here is Paul alone in Athens after being driven out of Philippi, Thessalonica and Berea, a solitary witness once again trying to be faithful in yet another strange and complex situation. Clearly, Paul has his feet firmly planted in the unknown. He's in an unknown city. He's in an unknown situation on his own without traveling companions or other believers for the first time in a long time. And he's in an unknown culture. At that time, Athens was a highly learned city, a hub for intellectual and cultural life within the Roman Empire, teeming with scholars and philosophers, with historians and poets, with artists and architects, and so many more. Athens was, after all, the city of Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom. So anybody who was anybody in the ancient Roman world or anybody who wanted to be anybody, went to Athens to try to make their mark on society. And suddenly, not through his own planning, but through the necessity of circumstances, Paul found himself in Athens alone. Now, to his credit, this didn't seem to quell Paul's spirit. The beginning of our scripture reading this morning said, while Paul waited for Silas and Timothy in Athens, he was deeply distressed to find that the city was flooded with idols. He began to interact with the Jews and Gentile God worshipers in the synagogue. He also addressed whoever happened to be in the marketplace each day. Paul got out his soapbox even though he was alone and took to the streets. Now, let me remind you that the religious policy of the Roman Empire at the time for the most part was to leave other religions alone. So long as the adherents of those other religions A, didn't cause trouble for the Romans, and B, continued to do what the Romans required of them, basically pay their taxes. Remember Jesus saying in the Gospel of Mark, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's? Yeah. So with this policy, with this Roman policy, a place like Athens, a melting pot of 
people from all over the empire who had come to study and learn and flourish, a city full of people who would have brought their own religions from whatever corner of the empire they hailed from. A place like Athens would have been awash in various religious centers and shrines and all manner of worship necessities and practices. And being the fervent, fervent evangelist that he was, Paul felt the need to speak. So Paul goes toe to toe with some of those learned philosophers in the streets. And poor Paul, he ends up getting dragged before another court. Our text said they took him into custody and brought him to the council on Mars Hill. Now Mars Hill was a rocky hill just outside of Athens, and it was the meeting place of the council of the Areopagites, the court of Athens. This is a court that dealt with all manner of issues from capital crimes to legal matters to political issues to educational and religious affairs. Yet even before this grand court in this intimidating setting overlooking the entire city of Athens, Paul speaks words of faith into the unknown. Paul stood up in the middle of the council on Mars Hill and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. As I was walking through town and carefully observing your object of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What you worship as unknown, I now proclaim to you. And from there, Paul goes on to tell the people about this previously unknown God. The God who created the heavens and the earth. The God who created humanity in all our complexities and beauty, in all our foibles and imperfections. The God who came to save God's most beloved creations, us. And there are two powerful lessons, I think, for us to take away from Paul's witness in this moment bursting with the unknown. The first is Paul's conviction, Paul's certainty. Paul doesn't claim to have all the answers to every question that the council could ask, but when it comes to his faith, Paul stands firm. He is secure in his relationship with God. He is secure in his trust of the person and work of Jesus Christ. And he is secure in his call to share his faith in any and all ways. Just because the situation all around Paul is full of the unknown doesn't mean that Paul has to let that unknown erode his own conviction. Even with all that he's been through, with all the cities he's been run out of, with all that he's currently facing, and even with the unknowns that his own future holds, Paul stands firm in his faith. And the second lesson that comes from that is that Paul doesn't throw that firmness back in the faces of those listening to him. Paul cites his own convictions, and his own experiences, he makes observations, observations, not judgments, about the city of Athens and the variety that he finds there. He draws in some cultural references that will mean something to those around him, that will help them relate to what he's saying without warping or manipulating that culture. In all his witnessing, Paul doesn't condemn the people of Athens. He doesn't accuse the people of Athens. He doesn't use his faith to threaten the people of Athens or to shame them for their unknowing. Paul simply declares the good news of God in Christ Jesus to them, opening up a door to perception for the people of Athens in between their known and their unknown. And friends, our challenge is to follow that example. One of the scholars that I read this week said, the challenge is to say to those around us, we see your spiritual hunger. Might we offer sustenance from our rich store of spiritual resource? 
The challenge is to find the imagery and the language that allow us to enter another's world in order to speak our truth honestly, respectfully, respectfully, and effectively. What does it mean to be so fully rooted and grounded in God, so centered in our own experience of the Christian story that we cannot keep from sharing it? In the midst of all the unknowns in the world, the world around us and even the world within us, what does it mean? To be so fully rooted and grounded in God, so centered in our own experience of the Christian story, that we cannot keep from sharing it. Amen. Our hymn is number 728, Somebody's Knocking at Your Door. to our time of prayer this morning. So let us join together in prayer. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ you taught us to pray. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers may serve your will and show your steadfast love. We pray for the world that you have made. Write what is wrong and feed and satisfy those who thirst for justice so that all your children may freely enjoy your creation and joyfully sing your praise. You have called us to be the church of Jesus Christ. Keep us on in faith and service, breaking bread together and proclaiming your good news to the world that all may believe you are love. Eternal God, you sent Jesus Christ to break down the walls of hostility that divide us. Send peace on earth and put down greed, pride, and anger, which turn neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. Bring about your peace in the hearts of all your children. O God, whom we cannot love unless we love our neighbors, Remove hate and prejudice from us and from all people so that all your children may be reconciled with those we fear, resent, or even threaten, so that we may live together in your compassion and grace. 
hope of all the earth. Give vision to those who serve in positions of leadership and power around the world, leaders of nations, those who serve the United Nations, those who govern at the local, state, and national levels here in America. Rain down your goodwill and justice that they may break down barriers, foster understanding, and draw the whole world together in peace. Merciful God, you bear the pain of the world. Look with compassion on all who are suffering, those who are living with illnesses or disabilities, those who are struggling with mental health, those who are dealing with stress, anxiety, and fear, those who are grieving. We pray especially this morning for Lance, for Neil, for Siri, for all those who knew and loved Linda and feel acutely the pain of her loss. We pray for those who are near the end of their lives as well as those who are caring for loved ones who are suffering. Holy One, bring your comfort and your healing, your hope and your promise that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come shall separate any of us from your love. Bless us and those we love, God, our friends and our families, our communities and our congregation here, that drawing close to you, we may be drawn closer to each other as well. Keep us in fellowship with one another, both near and from afar, in the joy of your eternal kingdom. In hope and confidence, Holy One, we pray to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our hymn is number 822, When We Are Living.
And for all of the different ways that our offering comes to us, let us pray to bless that offering. Generous God, by your grace we are free to follow wherever Jesus leads and to serve whomever you give us to serve. May the gifts that we offer here today help comfort those who mourn, feed those who are hungry, and liberate those who suffer. Inspire your church to be united in joyful service to this beautiful world that you have made. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, a few announcements this morning, all. Um, we had designated today as an indoor cleanup day to uh, kind of take care of some things around the church and also hopefully get a jump on uh, an inventory that we've been talking about putting together for insurance purposes. So if you can stick around for a little while after church and help out with either one of those, that would be great. Um, also this afternoon, for anybody that is interested, is the Pine Island uh, Baccalaureate. The Pine Island Area Ministerial Association is doing that. That's at 2 o'clock at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Pine Island. Um, it will also be streamed via St. Paul's website or uh, YouTube stream. Um, and I will put the link for that up on our Facebook page for anybody that would rather join virtually. Um, a couple of questions for you. One is, as we are trying, I sent an email about this last week, but as we're trying to kind of get a head count for uh, how many people we need to provide food for for our 150th celebration, if you could let us know whether you are planning to be here, that is uh, Sunday, July 10th. We'll have worship um, in the morning, and then after worship we're going to have a meal so we can celebrate the anniversary of 150 years here uh, in this little white church on the hill. Um, and for the catering, we're trying to get a, a, at least a rough head count. So if you have not let me know that you plan on being here, it would be great if you would do that. Um, I am also curious how many people are planning on being around 4th of July weekend. So um, if you are planning on being around 4th of July weekend, if you could let me know, that would be great. Um, I will be out of the office from May 25th through June 2nd. I will be down in Dubuque um, working on my doctorate uh, in person with my cohort. Uh, Reverend Tammy Ryder will be with you that Sunday. That's May 29th. That is Memorial Day weekend. Um, I will have my phone, but obviously from Dubuque will not be able to um, leave immediately. So you are free to call me, um, but I will be out of the office for about a week or so. Um, the other thing is that uh, June 5th is Pentecost, and throughout all of Lent, we worked on our testimony stories, our, our uh, sharing our stories of faith. So I am looking for people who are willing to share those stories of faith in the worship service and be the word of God for each other. I know that sounds intimidating, but really, this is basically what we do uh, the last Sunday of the year when we come together for our look at the year behind and the year ahead when we share with each other where we've seen God in the year that's passed and where we hope to see God in the future. It's basically that. It's not scary. So if I don't have people come and tell me they're willing to, I'm going to stop, come and start knocking on doors. So... Consider whether you are willing to share your story uh, with this family that loves you so much. And let me know if you decide to do that. <laughs> Those are the only announcements that I know of. Are there any others that I am missing this morning? Then I'll invite you to rise in body or in spirit. Friends, the unknown is out there. The unknown is in here, and it always will be. But the unknown doesn't have to be scary because in the midst of it all, God is always with us, holding us, encouraging us, inspiring us, and guiding us. And so as you go out into the unknown, friends, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.